Nursing Care of the Newborn, Part 2. Routine blood work is obtained per physician order, but normally you're going to get a glucose level and cord blood typing. Glucose levels below 40 milligrams per deciliter indicates hypoglycemia in the newborn. We do not recommend DELE suction routinely of gastric contents at birth because that fluid contains glucose. Um, it's been a procedure that has been done routinely in the past, but we're kind of getting away from that now. A hearing screening is done on all infants within the first month. If an infant does not pass, then the infant should be evaluated by an audiologist by three months of age. Phenyl ketonuria, all infants are going to be screened for PK, PKU. This is a condition where the infant cannot metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine, which is common in protein foods. This test is mandated by state law and every infant should be screened prior to discharge. These babies, if they, um, if it comes back where they are positive for PKU, then they are placed on a special diet as soon as possible or special formula that is low in phenylalanine and low protein foods when solids are started. This will decrease the risk of a disability and severe mental retardation. Breastfeeding is possible with these babies if labs are monitored closely. Some facilities are now monitoring or screening for congenital heart disease and uh, currently it's done in nine states and Kansas is obviously one of those because PRMC monitors for congenital heart disease. This is done with a, a Massimo pulse oximeter, so it's a special pulse oximeter. Congenital hypothyroidism is another screening that can be done. This is where the thyroid does not produce enough hormone and it can affect the entire body. Hypothyroidism is another cause of retardation. Galactosemia is the absence of the enzyme that will convert milk sugar to glucose. Hemoglobinopathies this includes diseases such as sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, and these are mostly found in infants of African, Mediterranean, Indian, or South and Central American descent. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia prevents adequate adrenal corticosteroid and aldosterone production, and it increases production of androgens. So. This is where the female infants may have increased masculine features. But each state mandates the infant screenings that are performed within its boundaries. Some just perform minimal ones, others perform a big workup of different screenings. But as far as, as required ones, PKU and hearing screening are required. Hyperbilirubinemia is an abnormally high level of bilirubin in the blood. We see deposits of bilirubin in the fatty tissues and they begin to take on a yellow coloring to their skin. Usually this is benign and it can be treated with sunlight and increased fluids. Then the bilirubin is excreted through the feces and the urine. Breastfed infants may have a higher level of bilirubin uh, due to a lower fluid intake initially, but breastfed infants can tolerate a higher bilirubin than formula-fed infants. The colostrum in mother's milk helps work as a laxative to remove that meconium from the intestines. The best treatment for this is prevention, and we do a prenatal identification of at-risk RH and ABO incompatibilities. This can allow for in utero treatment. 
we need to identify jaundice quickly and suspect pathologic jaundice if it occurs during the first 24 to 36 hours uh, after or after four days in the term infant. The other one would be the preterm. I'm sorry, that's both in the term. And with the preterm, it's prior to 48 hours. Pathologic jaundice is also called non-physiologic or abnormal jaundice, and it is more serious. It's caused by hemolytic disease due to incompatibility of the mother's and the fetus's blood. It can also be caused by conditions that will cause excessive destruction of the red blood cells, infections, hypothyroidism, polycythemia. A gestational diabetic mother is more likely to have an infant that develops jaundice. Or if the infant suffers hypoxia or respiratory acidosis, the risk for jaundice is increased. Term newborns can actually appear jaundiced at levels of 5 to 7 milligrams per deciliter, which really is not very high, and this is especially noted in the face. Cornicterus is the chronic and permanent discoloration as a result of bilirubin toxicity. The bilirubin deposits will cause a yellowish staining in the brain. A toxic level is going to be different for every newborn. Phototherapy is going to be the most common treatment for jaundice. So let's talk a little bit about phototherapy. It's provided via the incubator, which you see a picture of here, with a special light, a billy bed, or a billy blanket. About 10% of infants in the United States will receive phototherapy. Side effects of phototherapy, they will have frequent loose green stools, they may have a temporary lactose intolerance, and they may have an arimathitis uh, macular skin rash. Interventions are going to make sure that that temperature is maintained and doesn't get too hot or too cold. Make sure they have optimal nutrition. They're going to be fed more frequently. Protect the eyes and the genitals. You'll see in this picture that baby has an eye mask on and also has a diaper on. They wear the diaper but no other clothes. If they're laying on their uh, stomach or their side you may be able to do without the diaper. The treatment is providing that ultraviolet light to the skin surface. So if their skin surfaces are covered, then they're not getting any benefit from the phototherapy. So they can wear the diaper, but usually no other clothes. <clears throat> we make sure that we turn the infant from side to side to their back. And sometimes a billy blanket is used in conjunction with the um, incubator or instead of the incubator. We do not encourage any lotions or creams on the skin to prevent burning. Make sure mom and dad really know what's going on and encourage consistent exposure to the phototherapy for optimal results in addition to frequent feedings. When phototherapy is discontinued, we often see a rebound total serum bilirubin level increase of 1 to 2 milligrams per deciliter. The choice between breastfeeding or formula feeding is a decision that's best left to mom and possibly the significant other, but mothers should have complete information to be able to make that informed decision. If she is not committed to breastfeeding, then successful breastfeeding is doubtful. The nurse should assess the newborn being latched onto the breast at least every shift to help determine that there are no breastfeeding concerns. Full-term newborn will need 100 to 110 kilocalories per kilogram of body weight each day. As far as fluids, they're going to require 40 to 60 milliliters per kilogram a day the first couple of days. And by the end of the first week, they're going to be requiring 100 to 150 mLs per kilogram a day. Formula and breast milk will fulfill these needs and no additional uh, fluids are required. 
As far as breast milk, it will change in composition to fit what the newborn needs. The first milk is going to be colostrum, <coughs> excuse me, and you will see that for the first first few days after giving birth. It's a thick yellow substance. It's very rich in immunoglobulins, uh, so it contains a lot of antibodies. What it lacks in quantity, it's more than makes up for in quality. It's also referred to as liquid gold. The transitional milk will be the milk as it is changing from colostrum to milk. And the mature milk is what you will see after about two weeks of lactation. Breast milk will contain protein that the infant can easily metabolize. This is a species specific food, so these babies metabolize breast milk very, very easily. There's also carbohydrates with a major one being lactose and it helps improve the absorption of calcium and provide energy for brain growth. The fat in breast milk is more easily digested than cow's milk and this fat provides 50 percent of the calories in breast milk. It also has vitamins, high levels of A, E, and C, but vitamin D is low so mother may need to uh, increase her vitamin D intake or baby needs to have vitamin D. Minerals will absorb uh, iron five times better than those that are on cow's milk and it also has enzymes in it that aid in digestion. If babies are going to be formula fed the first feeding will be water. The first formula feeding is not until about five hours after birth. The reason for this is we need to be certain that the newborn is going to be able to swallow and hold down formula without spitting up and aspirating. Would much rather they aspirate water than formula. So make sure you're observing swallowing ability. As far as parent teaching, make sure they hold the newborns upright. Burping or bubbling should be after about every half ounce over the shoulder or in a sitting position with the head support while patting the back gently. Bottles are administered at least every three to four hours and they may take up to two or three ounces but they may only take an ounce and that also is perfectly normal. <coughs> Excuse me. The bottle should be heated by placing it in a container of hot water until it's warm. Make sure that the temperature is tested, uh, recommended like the inner arm. Spit up or reflux amount should be small, but if baby is, is spitting up quite a bit, then make sure that they are burped more often and that they are kept with their head up. As far as breastfeeding, they are recommended to be breastfed every two to three hours, whether they nurse or not. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more in depth about that during clinical. Newborns should double their birth weight by about four to five months. It's important to know that breast milk and formula usually has about 20 kilocalories per ounce, so uh, it's, it's pretty nutritious. Mothers should be encouraged to not give their babies cow's milk until they're at least a year old, and they should not administer any honey due to botulism risk. We look for bonding and attachment uh, in the newborn parental relationship. Bonding is going to be the rapid initial attraction that's felt by parents for the infants. It's unidirectional, so it goes from the parent to the child. The sensitive period is going to be the first 30 to 60 minutes after birth, and it's en it enhances bonding if the parents and infants are allowed to touch during this time period. And again, skin to skin contact is very beneficial for this. Bonding can occur at a later time period if necessary due to an obstetrical emergency or neonatal illness. 
Attachment is the process by which an enduring bond between a parent and a child is developed through pleasurable, satisfying interaction. It can begin during pregnancy and extend for many months after childbirth. It will usually follow a progressive or developmental course that will change over time, and it's rarely instantaneous. It occurs through mutually satisfying experiences. Unlike the bonding, attachment is reciprocal, and it will occur in both directions between the parent and the infant. With mater it also helps um, attachment through maternal touch, where the mother holds the infants in an in-face position, so the baby's face is at the same vertical plane as her own. Verbal behaviors are also important indicators of maternal attachment. <coughs> Excuse me. The mother refers to the baby as a he or a she rather than it, or saying, I can't believe she's finally here. Um, those types of statements could indicate bonding. Different interventions to help encourage bonding and attachment of the newborns to the parents or the parents with the newborn, <coughs> excuse me, will be the skin-to-skin -skin contact or touch, encouraging infant care by the parents, encouraging rooming in, providing parental education as to what is normal and what is abnormal, infant care and safety, assessing the learning level of the parents' knowledge and teach to their understanding. You know, if they don't understand what's going on or they don't know how to do something, then they can be reluctant to care for and bond or attach with the infant. And by providing resources, phone numbers, websites, etc., where they can get answers to questions at any time of the day or night. Also remember that if mom is hurting or she's physically exhausted, she requires pain relief and she may require some assistance with a newborn until she can get some rest so that she will be better able to enjoy that early experience with her newborn. We provide patient teaching to all new parents whether they have no children at home or whether they have 10 children at home. We try and keep the teaching universal because some have forgotten something or uh, they may have questions over something but you just never assume that just because they have kids at home that they already know everything. The teaching should occur throughout the hospital stay and then prior to discharge a summary of the teaching should be given. We provide written instructions in addition to help remind them of the teaching that has been provided. A lot of birth care facilities will provide hotlines for new parents to call with questions or concerns after discharge. <clears throat> and a lot of facilities will provide a well mother, well baby exam two to three days after discharge. And this allows mom and baby to come back into the hospital where there's no cost to it, um, but they're allowed to ask questions, the nurse can assess both mother and infant to make sure that things are going well. Safety considerations that should be taught. A uh, few pieces of equipment are absolutely essential for the newborn. You don't need a lot for a brand new baby. Use caution with hand-me-down infant equipment. Make sure that it has been checked carefully to ensure that all parts are strong and working properly. As far as car seat safety, the child must be in an infant car seat or prove that one is available prior to the infant being discharged from the birth care facility. Children under two years of age have to be in a car seat that is rear facing. The incline is going to be approximately 45 degrees. Shoulder straps will be in the lowest position and slightly below the shoulders. Make sure that those straps are snug and not twisted, that the restraint clip is mid-chest to axillary level, and ensure that it is secured in the vehicle per the manufacturer's instructions. As far as crying, 
Crying will peak at approximately six weeks at up to about three hours a day. So it's pretty normal to have babies cry. They decrease to one hour per day by about three months. Crying is going to signal unmet, unmet needs. One thing that you can do to help calm crying is swaddling. It frequently will comfort the infants. Colic is going to be irritable crying for no obvious reason for three hours or more a day. Usually late afternoon to evening, at least three days a week, is of crying is used to diagnose colic. Often will begin at about two to three weeks of age and peak at about six to eight weeks and doesn't end until about three to four months. Different interventions for colic will be therapeutic communication with the parents so they can appropriately express their frustrations, teach the parents coping skills, encourage the parent to leave the child with a babysitter for short periods because the parents need time to recoup after some of these crying jags. Feeding the infant in an upright position to help decrease a gassy stomach burping frequently might help. Changing the formula if the infant has signs of allergy, but formula should not be changed without uh, physician approval. Chamomile tea can be given to reduce antispasmodic effects. Putting the baby in a quiet environment using a calm approach and again with physician approval using Mylocon gas drops. Many newborns <coughs> excuse me, are going to sleep 16 to 17 hours a day, and they sleep less deeply than adults. Newborns and babies often make noises and movements when they're sleeping, and that can awake pa uh, parents if they're sleeping in the same room. Going to the infant when they're making these noises or movements can awaken the infant so usually you kind of step back and wait and see if they go ahead and wake up or not. Make certain that babies are put to sleep on their back. Uh, if you feel they need to go to sleep in a different position they can be on their side but uh, they should not be placed to sleep on their stomach. By 12 weeks of age many infants will sleep about five hours through the night. Room temperature is going to be warm enough for uh, the babies. It doesn't need to be any hotter. Dress them as the parent would dress and you can add one more layer than what mom or dad has on. There should be a minimum of six wet diapers a day. With formula fed babies there may be only one stool a day but breastfed babies can have as many as a stool after every feeding. Make sure that you keep infants away from people who smoke, um, or while they're smoking anyway. And again, smoking will increase the risk of SIDS. Make sure that you inform mom when it's appropriate, or teach the parents about obtaining appropriate immunizations and or give them an immunization schedule. Frequently they will receive the hepatitis B vaccine in the hospital prior to discharge and they follow up with a couple more um, later on. And parents also need to know when the appropriate time to call the physician is. As far as peri care, it should be done with every diaper change. Use of disposable wipes or cloths are quite uh, quite okay. If there's any sign of diaper rash or redness of the perineum, then ointment may be required to help keep the stool and urine off of the skin. With girls make sure that you cleanse front to back only and teach the parents this. With the males, if the male is uncircumcised, teach the parent not to force that foreskin down. 
and with circumcision, uh, encourage them to wash it gently and again keep the Vaseline on it until it's well healed. With bathing, it's only recommended every other day and historically the bath was going to be a sponge bath until the cord fell off or the circumcision is healed and then a tub bath. But recent literature states that tub baths do not increase the risk of infection. So some facilities will go ahead and give tub baths. We bathe prior to feeding the infant to help avoid reflux or aspiration. Make sure that you have all of the supplies prior to starting the bath. Do not leave the infant unattended in the bath. Don't scrub the vernix off. It will absorb. Use warm water, warm room, and mild soap. Always wash clean to dirty. So you start with the eyes and the face with a wet washcloth and no soap. With the eyes, make sure that you use a clean portion of the rag for each eye. Shampoo the hair. Then you clean the trunks, the trunk the legs and the perineum. Make certain that you wash and dry the creases and the folds thoroughly to help prevent any infections. You can apply lotion to the skin, but we don't recommend powder because of the, in, of the risk of inhalation of the powder. The nails should be cut straight across and smooth edges can be smoothed out with an emery board. Don't cut the nails too short. And sometimes cutting the nails when the newborn is asleep is really recommended. It makes it, the job easier. The umbilical cord will be clamped shortly following birth. And the upper left picture shows that cord clamp in place with the upper right showing the cord clamp. The cord clamp will then be removed within about 24 hours and lower left is a picture of a cord clamp remover. The cord will dry and fall off in approximately 10 to 14 days. It does turn brown black in about two to three days. There's a picture of that in the right lower after the clamp has been removed. Make certain that you assess the cord with every diaper change for any bleeding, foul odor, or redness at the base. It needs to be kept clean. An evidence-based practice will show cleaning with water when necessary and then keeping it clean and dry is the best method of cord care. Although many facilities will continue to teach cleaning with alcohol to keep that cord dry. Make certain that you fold the diaper down below the cord until the cord falls off. And it is not unnecessary to have a slight odor or slight bleeding when the cord falls off, but this usually will resolve very quickly, usually within a day. <laughs> Preterm births are the largest cause of death in the first year of life. Preterm is considered to be less than 37 weeks gestation. I know I have 38 weeks on your slide and I apologize for that, but it's 37 weeks. Causes of preterm birth can be due to multiple births, maternal illness, gestational hypertension, an abnormal placenta, poverty, smoking, alcohol consumption, and drug abuse. These newborns will have very transparent and loose skin. You may see, you probably will see superficial veins. They have no subcutaneous fat. They have lots of lanugo and abundant ver vernix. They have short extremities. There's few creases on the soles of their feet. They have protruding abdomen, short fingernails and toenails, and small genitalia. Problems that you can see with newborns will be an inadequate respiratory function, you often see retractions or seesaw respirations, flaring of the nares, grunting, tachypnea, and cyanosis. You may see respiratory distress syndrome or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a toxic response to oxygen, apnea, and hypoxia. 
Other problems you can see will be sepsis, poor thermoregulation, hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia, increased bleeding risk, retinopathy, poor nutrition, necrotizing enterocolitis, which is an acute inflammation of the bowel that can actually lead to bowel necrosis, immature kidneys, and jaundice. Post-term newborns, physical characteristics are going to be loose skin, dry cracked peeling skin, minimal to no lanugo or vernix noted. Fingernails may be very long. These babies are have lost some brown fat during delivery, so that's why you see the loose skin. So perinatal injury and malformations, there are several different areas that we look at. With the nervous system, there can be some neural tube defects, and this is a failure of the spinal cord to close at the top or the bottom. Folic acid in the early months of pregnancy can help prevent this. We see these defects in the form of hydrocephalus, which is a failure of the spinal fluid to drain from the head and that head gets very large, and spina bifida. Gastrointestinal, you can see the cleft lip, cleft palate. These are fissures or openings in the upper lip. It can be one side or both sides, or the roof of the mouth. The musculoskeletal system, you can see the club foot, which is the congenital anomaly in which the foot is twisted inward or outward and developmental hip dysplasia, and I showed you the slide of that earlier. This is a dislocation of the hip, and it really is more common in girls than boys. Metabolic, you have the phenylketonuria, and we've talked about this, where they do not metabolize the phenylalanine and can result in severe mental retardation without an appropriate diet. The maple syrup urine disease is where um, the body does not process amino acids and it can result in acidosis, cerebral degeneration, and death within two weeks if it's not treated. The galactosemia, where they don't process galactose or lactose, it can actually cause cirrhosis of the liver, cataracts, and mental retardation if it's left untreated. Chromosomal, we have the Down syndrome, and I have the picture here that shows the uh, characteristics of Down syndrome, uh, physical characteristics. Hemolytic disease, such as erythroblastosis fetalis, which is caused by the RH incompatibility, or no rogam had been administered during a previous pregnancy. This can cause progressive hemolysis, anemia, heart failure, fetal hypoxia, and generalized edema. Intracranial hemorrhage is the most common birth injury. Transient tachypnea of the newborn. We see ras rapid respirations that can be accompanied by retractions, grunting, or mild cyanosis. And usually this will resolve after three days. Meconium aspiration syndrome is respiratory distress caused by aspirating meconium. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is newborn withdrawal from maternal drugs or alcohol. And an infant of a diabetic mother. These babies can be hyperglycemic. We see macrosomia. In other words, they're very large. They can also be hypoglycemic. Frequently will have respiratory distress syndrome. They may also be intrauterine growth restricted or IUGR if they had poor, poor placental perfusion and they are at a higher risk for hyperbilirubinemia. A couple of slides on some of the complications found in newborns.